Sir. Do you think you bring some of your talks from one day over here? Because as uh, we realize one day is uh, one of those days, you know, the last uh, two, three days of the uh, Bible. We want to try and see if we can save time. Yes. Hello. 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 Tell, tell me five minutes and I'll be done in five minutes. Then you can start Well, this is uh, the... the, the um, Contrary to popular belief, you can actually access this website. This is a website where you can download some information. Each site has, in the UK has to fill out an annual appraisal on how they are for training and how they go about teaching. The people responsible for supporting the Chief Executive Officer, the CEO of the hospital, and the various constitutions. So if we have a look at this, this is something that we need to look at. These are the new assessment tools. So the one that you're, you've got, that's old. Okay, this now has taken its place, it's been superseded. How they've moved is that they've gone from maximum supervision to not applicable and that you're competent. If you look at the form you've got, when it comes in the UK for you to be signed off, the old system would be that you could get away with threes and fours. The new system, every one of you, if it's not applicable, you have to be here. You have to be competent. They've taken into account a lot of things. And into account, do you know the indication? Was it the correct indication for the colonoscopy? The big question for yourself is, would you perform this colonoscopy yourself with the information that is on the actual re referral? So I don't know what systems you work in, but whether, if you're working in your own private sector where you've seen a patient, you've decided that it's appropriate, well, that's not applicable because you've already decided the indication is appropriate. But if you're working like myself in a clinical setting where there's a lot of uh, third tertiary referrals, uh, and Vakar will tell you that, they come down, a lot of the time the referral is a waste of time. Abdominal pain on its own is not a referral. I'll reject it every day. The patient will have been prepped. You'll think, oh, it's an opportunity. I don't think it's an opportunity. Can I defend this? I can't defend it. If I was to do harm, can I defend it? If the answer is no, then therefore that's one against. The risks, we confirm consent, preparation, that's about, if you're wondering where, what they all mean, if you come to the bottom, it will then tell you what each and every one's about. So pre-procedure checks ensures the assistant staff have appraised the current case. So. What have I said to you today? The take home message from today is, is that during the procedures several times, I've drawn attention to the staff that are working with us. Are you happy? The last case, Rima, everything okay? Yes. If she said it wasn't okay, we stop. The case before, if we're going along, are we comfortable? No problem at all. Eric, what do you think? Not an issue. I listen to what those guys are saying because they can see what the patient's doing. Even though I'm able to see what's going off at the same time. I need people who I trust around me to actually tell me that this is what's happening. So that's what that's about. The equipment. We've already had a chap today who came up when we were doing with the mannequin and his take home message is he always needs to make sure that the equipment is checked. So these are things that are part of your assessment tool now. The procedure, the actual procedure itself carries very little in comparison to what else. 
because we've moved on to management of findings. And is there a reason why we've moved on to management of findings? The reason why we've moved on to management of findings is, is that there are a lot of people who are doing colonoscopy, gastroscopy, even ERCPs, and they're not making a recommendation. At the end of it, you need to follow up. You're not just a technician, you're there for a purpose. The purpose is, is to do the test, deliver the appropriate practice during that test, make an assessment, and based on that assessment, put into place an appropriate plan. And that plan forms the basis for the treatment and for the patient to move forward. Should things change, then that's up to the clinician who's looking after the patient. But currently, you're the person who's eyeballed it and you need to give it. It's a bit like the old days of a barium enema. The old days of a barium enema, the best time to interpret the barium enema was at the time it was being done, not afterwards. And that's a colonoscopy also, because there are subtle changes that happen during a colonoscopy that you don't notice, that you can't write in the report. I'll tell you about an interesting case, Ad. Anastomotic, uh, anastomosis, patient had a history of Crohn's. They've got normal colonic bridging across the anastomotic site, so it looks like they've got two entrances going in, in through the stoma. So I've got a MRI scan, everything sorted out, and with a sphincterotome, I've cut the bridge. <laughs> but you mustn't make judgments like this without having proper discussion. The proper discussion is not just with the patient, but it's with the clinician who's minding the patient, looking after the patient, but also your surgical colleagues. We come down here. Report writing. <coughs> Report writing is the most important thing that you can say. Now, if you write normal, one man's normal is another man's enemy. So if I wrote colon normal, what does it mean? It means nothing. It's not worth the paper it's written on. What have you seen? The mucosa looks unremarkable. It doesn't look engorged. The, the vascular pattern, unremarkable. Normal size. Remark on it. It's important. Right? There are four things that you need to put on a report. One, there is a reason that I have in the question. They're having the procedure, so answer the question. So that's one. Say what you've seen, say what you've done, and give a recommendation. They're the four things you need to do. If I was to say to you, the last five reports you've done, can you honestly turn to yourself and say, I've answered the question, why did they come? I've said on the report what I've done, what I've seen, and that you've added a recommendation. And I would say to you all, to a man, that you probably haven't ticked all the boxes in all of those four. Because we, are, we do become a little bit lazy, but at the end of the day, if it's your patient, you can actually remember what you've seen and done. If it's not your patient, these patients don't, these doctors don't know you. They need to see that. They need to see what's in front of them. Endoscopic non-technical skills. This is communication and teamwork. Situation awareness, leadership, judgment, decision making. Did you make the appropriate judgment call at the time it was necessary? The saturations have dropped. Did you stop? Did you give the supplemental oxygen? Etc. Etc. So this is what these are all over. Learning objectives. Minimum of three learning objectives are to be given. And that's for yourselves. So you've each got learning objectives. If you sat down today and remembered what we did with the mannequins, each of you, I asked you, what was your learning objective from that? Now, that's not just because of this. It's what I always do. But the, for yourselves, have an idea of what your learning objectives was for today. Because you two guys, I'll go through yours shortly, you two guys have got an idea. You know what I've asked you to do. Because I've written it on your thing, what you need to do. We'll do the same. So, but sometimes it's very difficult when it's actually down in black and white because it seems a little bit confrontational. We're in a, in a position, and I actually think it's an honorable position where we can actually give you an opportunity to shortcut, make a shortcut which we never had, right? If you actually sit down and look, there's 90 years minimum between us of colonoscopy, gastroscopy, 90 years of doing it. I'm not going to bore you and tell you a number that I've done, but added to us lot, 
if you actually sit down and look at us, we've probably done about 150,000 colonoscopies between us. It was three. So if you actually sit down and think about that number of procedures in the 90 years of experience, that actually puts it in perspective. 90 years between us, 2,000 a year, not, it's not unachievable. You know, and we do it between us. So that's what gives us a little bit of an insight in enabling you to shortcut things. There's new equipment coming onto the market. Know what the equipment does. Know what its limitations are. If you saw earlier when Saad was talking to you uh, before we actually did the mannequin, I was actually looking at the piece of equipment. Now the piece of equipment that come through was a Chinese system. I was looking at it and comparing it to other systems that I've seen. And it's a usable piece of equipment. I've got no problems with using it, but I do have a problem with no one's used it yet on a live case, and to bring it out and for me then to mess about with it in a learning environment, we're going to potentially cause risk to the lovely piece of equipment. Let's not do that, and that's why we swap the equipment. As you can see, confirmation of consent is a big thing. We, we Consent in the UK is a, is a, a big bone of contention. In Pakistan, you, you, the patient may not be the person that you consult for the com, consult, confirmation of consent, etc. So let's just be, be, be mindful about how we deliver things, because we deliver it with the, uh, the blinkers of the UK system in Europe. So that's what we need to be mindful of. But there are very good things that you can take home. One is, you need to make sure that people have an opportunity, the family, whoever, have an opportunity to go through things. We need to make sure that the preparation, the room, everything is ready. What is the point in taking off a polyp and then saying to the nurse, can I have now something to inject it with? You know you're going to do something. Make sure the equipment is there and ready, just in case. You don't have to open it. I'm not saying open it. Make sure it's there. You are putting a person at risk. Forward planning. Also, it makes you look good that you're actually prepared and that you're not tempting fate. Sedation. Most complications come from sedation. Now, there is a new module, there is a new package, and I'll, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit down with Saad, and he's going to forward you this, and over the ne next week, Tuesday and Wednesday, he and I are going to sit down, and I'm going to go through the websites that you guys, I'm going to get you access for, and there are online modules that you can do, and you can assess yourself, and there are videos, and there are various things. There's a module for sedation, and you will be certificated at the end of it. And these are things you can access. Scope handling. Seeing how all this, one, two, all the items that carry, but the actual emphasis on using the scope has had a slight shift. So we are looking at how you manage the scope, handle the scope. It's always been a, an issue that I believe that we spend too much time people focusing on just getting the scope from A to B. We don't care how we get there. We don't care what happens in between. All we're interested in is doing it. That's not the case. What we should be doing is this supports all this. And then you're able then to give a safe, competent process for a patient to go through. This is one particular bone of contention of one national trainer, and he was allowed to make sure that this was in. And Vaka knows him very well. You also know him very well. And uh, he's a tall fella from Liverpool. And he believes that you should be able to do all this type of stuff. It's not an issue. What he's talking about here is, is that you're able to make the correct decision where the scope is going to go, which is not unsensible. And you can include all of this. Integrated technique, so in other words, big wheel back torque, insufflation, advance, all this. Individual components, tip steering, unnecessary movement. The trick to it, for tip control, be slow, do it with purpose, know where you're going, make a decision. 
If it's not going to all of those, stop, be slow, make a decision. Air management, proactive solving, loop management, pace, progress. Now, you're all, you guys now are sitting down and thinking, this is a basic skills, this is a basic thing, tool, that we have to do. I have to fill out on every procedure that I would do with you as a trainee until you've got to a competent level of practice. A competent level of practice is that you reliably, in 80% of the time, can get to the transverse colon. Uh, and then I'll be saying, right, we will not do this process on this patient, we'll do it on the next patient. I'll select two patients from the list, and then we'll go from there. The take home message for you guys is, if you're learning and you've got eight patients on the list, that it's pointless you're doing all eight. You're not going to learn anything. You're going to get frustrated. It's better that you turn to your boss and say, would you mind if I did one or two? If you, and then you did the others. He'd appreciate it because I'm sure he'd want to expedite the list, but you then optimize your learning on the two. Once you become better and able to reproduce your skills, you can then say, can I do three? Move forward. Don't try to, you're not going to succeed if you keep confusing yourself. We've already discussed how variable, the big variable in colonoscopy, which is the patient. If you did eight varied abdomens in one day, what are you going to remember from it? Just the frustration of not getting round. If you did two and you did them very well, it doesn't matter if you didn't succeed, but you did two and you did them very well and you were able to reproduce the skills necessary, eventually you will actually learn the skills more appropriate as you develop them and able to actually reproduce them on a regular basis. Even more. Pathology recognition. There are things on the, on now on the website where we talk about different pathology where we image recognition. Image recognition is exceedingly important. I don't know if you've got the references, but the reference, you, Atlas of Gastroenterology, outstanding. You can go on, look at colon, different types of polyps. Look at it. Look at the types of different polyps. Know what QDO is. Know what, how to actually classify polyps. Describe what an LST is. Describe what a 2A, 1C, all that stuff till the cows come home. That's great. That means something to Saad. That means something to Vaka. That means something to me. What it don't mean, it don't mean anything to majority of doctors that are out there. So you might know it, but that doesn't mean they do know it. So describe it. If it's going back to a gastroenterologist, then put it as a 2A, 1C, whatever it is you want to put it as. Not a problem. Forest classification when it comes to gastric, not an issue. But what I'm saying to you is, remember who the person is who's reading it. Not, if you put 2A1C to a patient, they're going to think, what the hell is that? They're then going to ring somebody up and say, he's wrote this. What the hell does this mean? Right? Write what you're seeing. Ulcer, five centimeter in diameter, heaps rolled edges, irregular, depressed center, etc. Sloughed, no focus of bleeding. Tells you loads, but 2A1C also means a similar. But what you've got to do, is then be mindful of who your recipient is who's reading it. And that's what this is about. Report writing, back to the report writing. Management plan, communication teamwork, leadership, judgment decision making. So how we've actually gone in the UK, they've gone and decided that they need to now deconstruct everything and they've gone from a period where you will do 200 colonoscopies in the last three months of your achieving that 200 colonoscopies you need to have a 90 percent sequel intubation rate in the preceding three months you needed to take off a one centimeter polyp in the preceding three months you have got a mean therapeutic dose of giving midazolam no more than two milligrams, etc., etc., etc. So there are specifics that they give. And these are called KPIs. The KPIs are key performance indicators. The KPI itself are meaningless. If 
for me to say to you a KPI that I've reached a cecum in 96.8 of all my patients this year. Well, that's true, but what does it mean? The KPI that they're moving to is, have you got any interval cancers in the intervening three years? Now that tells you how effective your skill is. I can get to the cecum, but I miss everything on the way. So there is a new one moving in, which is the interval cancers. Being able to actually do it safely, reduce complications. How many perforations have you had? Those are important ones. But sequel intubation rate alone is no longer the one that is the big measure. Okay? It's missed pathology. That's the big measure. Don't they go hand in hand? They do, but what goes mostly uh, with regard it is being an honest individual. Now you're, you're probably wondering what I'm saying. He understands what I'm saying. The fact is, is that a lot of people, they say they get to the cecum, they don't necessarily get to the cecum. There are some people who say terrible prep, and it's not terrible prep, it's just that it's one of the hardest colons to get round, and they'll say, bring it back for Dr. Niaz to do, bring it back for Paul or Vakar to do. And so those times, you, you, you spot it a mile off. I've got one now at our place, and... I've stopped him scoping because he's useless, man. He doesn't even cover his mouth when he coughs in front of the patient stood opposite the face, man. So. <laughs> uh. so you can see where we, we've gone with regards to this. And you can download that from there. You can look, you can see even dots for stents. Yeah, CP. Pediatric, we do separate them. Now, pediatrics never used to have this type of system. Pediatrics in the last six months have now come into this system. In the UK, this course is mandatory. Mandatory. The upper GI basic skills course is mandatory. It's not mandatory here. I would suggest that in 10 years' time, that I would feel that this course when reproduced in other centres would be, you'd start to look at it and consider that it needs to be mandatory with the guys coming through and you've preempted it. So hats off to you guys for coming and doing the course. This course in the UK was not initially mandatory but when they saw that the guys who have been doing the course, how their sequel intubation rate was at a higher re reproducible level than those who hadn't done it, and that their learning curve was longer than these guys, they decided to make it mandatory. None of these courses that you see, ERCP, dilatations, therapeutic courses, none of those will be made mandatory in the UK again, I can quite assure you. The reason being, with regards to that, is because of cost to you guys. If it's mandatory, you have to do it. If it. And the cost that comes with it is going to be quite astronomical because you'd need one to do this. If you want to do dilatations, you need to do the course with dilatations. If you need to do the ERCP, you need to do that. You need to do this. These courses are optional. However, how we get around it in the UK is, I would say to you, you've come to us, you've done 200 colons. That's virtually you know what a trainee would do and then we'd be looking at signing them off then I'd say to you what size polyps have you taken off then I'd say to you if you want to take off polyps have you done them you know have you done the mandatory course she said no well I can't let you do it but if you come and you've been signed off and then you want to do polyps I'll say to you what what courses have you been on oh, I've not been on any polyp courses okay while you're in this department, you can't take any polyps off greater than one millimeter, one centimeter. You won't be happy with that, but I'll stop you. If you want to take off bigger polyps, I'll say that we have, we've got polyp courses. Off you go to do them. And you'll turn around and you'll say, well, I haven't got the money to do that, and they're not compulsory, and they're not mandatory. And my answer to you is this. In the UK, we have smart, very clever doctors and very smart, very clever lawyers. Both work next to each other. If you put a hole in someone's bowel 
and there is a course available to actually teach you because they can show evidence how courses have actually reduced risk to patients what you've attended why did you not attend this course what makes you different what makes you better would you have learnt anything from this and if you say no they'll tear you to pieces if you say yes why did you take off the polyp so both ways you're at wrong that's the UK so we have to be very very careful so the way that you can do it you can get support from your colleagues from your mentors now Saad's I come here Saad's my mentor at the end of this he'll turn around and say you know maybe this maybe that I don't mind because you're here to learn you've got to learn as I described him when I landed in the airport some fella come up and he's you know and he says would you like to come this way do you know Dr. Saad as well I says I do I treat him as my brother and he says oh okay I said my elder brother We've got one for pegs, colonoscopy. Now this, when you look down, DOPIS, this is the polyps. Okay, and that's a formative one for DOPIS. Now you're gonna look at it, I'll just show it you. Again, it becomes a little bit boring, but um, we won't spend too much time on it, but you need to do it. Polyp, access and view. The big thing that we actually say in the UK, take a picture of the polyp before you do it, take the picture of the site afterwards. If you, I would say to you, if you don't take a picture of the polyp site afterwards, I would say you're trying to hide something. Decent. Yes. Uh, Here, uh, everything's videoed. Even if my picture doesn't work, sometimes yours yeah. is an issue. My mobile, I have to take a picture. And in the UK, you can't do that. That's a breach of um, confidentiality. There's been two consultants who are currently serving long-term suspensions for taking a photograph on the mobile phone and forwarding it to the clinician concerned. It's uh, garbage. one of them has been suspended. Oh, right. <laughs> so, so, but, but the point is, I mean, I personally think this, mm. uh, this is all nonsense, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. Excuse my language. So what, what you're trying to do as long as you're not doing it for the time, what I'm saying is that if you don't have the, uh, the, uh, have the option of documenting, documenting it, you take a picture and I don't send it to mm. others, I send it to the... If you go to send it to somebody, take the name off. It's very easy to talk. Yeah. Then nobody can say anything. Absolutely. But the thing, you, you'll get out. Tomorrow what we've got is a talk from um, Richard Hind. And 
This is a basic skills course. It's not about teaching you to take polyps off. But what it, the talk tomorrow, the emphasis, what I, I would like you to take home from it, is how to assess polyps. And that's the most important thing, how to assess it correctly. So DOPIS, you've got there. You can e easily see on block all this type of stuff. And again, how much information is required. So you can see what the UK is doing. I'm not saying that this is great. I'm in heavily involved in this. So I buy into it. But I also find coming here exceedingly refreshing because it's very light. I don't have to do too much of this. The other thing is, is that they've moved the polyp size. So for trainees doing the 200, then going to the provisional, used to be a one centimeter polyp. Now they're saying up to three centimeters. You're telling me someone who's done 200 is not a cat in house. So, pants, man. Not you, I'm just saying. So hopefully that's been enlightening. The most important thing for you is to actually see that there are sites that you can go to. Ignore this, this is rubbish. So, uh, training courses, shows you how to do it. OGD, these are things that you can download. Ent's handbook, various things. They do help you. This is uh, something that we, we need to talk about, sir. And training skills, tables, attributes. So that's one thing that we need to actually um, just have a very quick look at. So when, when we've got, we're looking at training skills, best practice, cop, patient friendly behaviors. Can you see how they're breaking it down? All these numbers, are, we, there are a lot of things, training domains. And, tra and so you've got training domain one meets that, training domain three meets that. And all this, this is how they've gone to in the UK. And I think that sometimes we go OTT. Okay. Oh, yeah. So let me just get this up. Then. What's that crap? That password is one of the lead passwords in the UK and it can adjust this system live and all this type of stuff. So I, when he said it, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Right, here we go. Gin. Now, gin endoscopy for nurses. This is not a nurse, is it? But they even the training guys, this is something that we need to talk about. This, we can access for your guys. I'm going to try and register your centre on here, this centre. We could even consider your other. So, programme information, training centres. So, this will give you a list of the training centres in the UK. Now, JETS. So, Joint Industrial Training uh, System. It was first devised about uh, 10, 15 years ago. It's become more incentivized. There is a list of courses that you can do and training centers. This is a list of the training centers now in the UK. So the, co the UK has a requirement to provide 660 compulsory places in courses per year. They can't, they can't meet the demand. So si 660 places per year. That's minimum. So that's of guys who are on the registrars who are on the training program alone, let alone guys who come from Pakistan and India and all that as clinical fellows. We have a requirement 
to service 660 registrars per year with the compulsory courses. Okay, so which? No, it's not hard to get on the courses. The, how they've made it now is, is that you would apply for the course. I'll then say to you, who's backing you? Now, you, you apply to me in the UK. Simple, I'll say, who's backing you? You say, Saad, I then contact him, and then that job's done. The same thing happens, but it's electronic. You'll say, who's backing you? And then I'll say, who's your training lead? I'll then contact him electronically. And then he then contacts me electronically and says, I endorse this. Should something you come along and you be an appropriate candidate, I, I do not send you back the report. I'll send you back a report as per discussion. I'll ring you up and I will talk to you. I'll not talk to you, I'll talk to him. I'll say, this guy you sent me. Okay, this is my hospital. So this is the same for everything else. So I'm comfortable about talking about my hospital. I'll talk to you about the others if you want. But this is going on camera. Types of courses we offer. So you can actually do all these type of things. It gives you, this is the course you have got. This is the course you are doing. Three day course. So the room that I've been in this afternoon, 3D imager. You have got this course. Okay? Transmit it to the delegates. You've got it. Okay? Focuses, development, individualized program. So at the end of the day, I've talked to you already, I've talked to you, so we're looking at we're looking at how to actually individual. We look at you as trainees. Later on after the end of today, we sit down and I'll make no bones about it, we talk about it. Okay? Then we come back and we have a better understanding of how to actually help and support you tomorrow. That's the best way to help you. And that's what we do. Ready to support. Ready to support. That's what we do there. Super. I'll then talk to your trainer, your supervisor. Saab does that. Sayyid Qureshi, he does that. So they'll talk to you, you know, about this is what we would suggest to help you. So that's what happens. Essential for the trainees is on training list per week. So what we ask you, what access do you have to adopt? There's no point in you coming here do endos to do this course and then never touch on the scope again. What's the point? So this this is the basics fundamental. This is the UK course. This is this course. So you can see. Uh, one space left. I've already put somebody on that. That's next on Monday. So Steve, Steve Foley, he's gastroenterology service lead. He's going to talk to you tomorrow. Um, he tends to mumble, but just say thank you. Uh, the fat guy, that's all right. That's my work wife. Not my wife, my work wife. Okay. Jane's off at the moment. Badri, absolute superb man. Lorraine, barking like a box of frogs, but absolutely brilliant trainer. This guy, look how young he looks. <laughs> and so th that's just to say the core faculty of where we are. How to find this accommodation, how to apply. Very simple how to apply. And then you just click that. Then you fill out the referral. Up it comes and then off you go. It says here, course finder. You then fill in application. It's not an issue. So. Centre details. So you can look at the centre. So that's us. I can then say to who's who, who's what. That's about reserved places, three delegates. So this is how you can manage the actual centres. Course administration, scheduling. Now this is the one that you're going to be interested in. Now. In the UK, we certificate you. Two means that someone's always going to be in the room with you. One means that you're learning and someone's going to be stood right next to you. 
that's the simplest way I can put it. Three, you can do certain procedures on your own, but somebody has to be in the department. Four, so this guy is a consultant. He's been a consultant now for three years. Till he gives evidence to me, and I say at every course, till that man gives evidence to me, he's not nationally accredited. But he has actually been allowed to do certain things. So till he gives it me, I won't. So Steve allows him, I won't accredit him. Gastroenterologist. He was a trainee of mine. He used to be on this system. He says he's never been on this system. He's a liar. He's a liar. I put him on the system. Yes, yes. So, Sakib Ahmad, absolute wonderful doctor. Wonderful doctor. Badri, who you've seen. Lorraine Clark. Now you can see here we've got fours and we've got sixes. Sixes stands for somebody, they're not the devil, stands for somebody who teaches and teaches guys like Saad, Vaka, myself. Okay, that's what sixes stand for. I will come on to um, someone's portfolio and shortly. This guy, okay, so you've got sixes. Now if I have a look here, e-portfolio. Now what happens is, is that you have an electronic record of you as a trainer and as a trainer. So once all this it finishes, I'll then pull it up. Training feedback. Now, trainers. This is the training feedback throughout, okay? Since February 2008, 2016, but that's a lot of the trainers. If we come to Paul. So you can see from here, September to there, 2008, 2016. This is 467 times I've been doing things in that period of time. So we're talking eight years. So trainees, feedback, etc. So trainees then feed back on you, as you can see. Green mean that they agree with what's being said. And then they write down all sorts of various things down here. It's anonymized. I don't know who's written what or anything. Okay, so you can look down there. You can see where pe what people say about you. It's nice. And I, often when I feel a little bit down, I think, oh, let's go and have a look. Paul this, Paul that, Paul the other. But never mind. But it's very, very constructive. Brian McKay is the national lead. So he is, and as you can see from Brian's Again, he's done less than me. Done it in the same period of time. And his, they are real figures. So his greens aren't as high, but that doesn't matter. The fact is, is that we're very focused on training. We've got a lot of input. There's a lot of variables. And so you've got to actually bear that in mind. And so we, we actually go around the country. Brian goes around the world like myself teaching, and it's very, very good to show you that it's not all roses and that there can sometimes be people who they are, are not liked by the trainees, you can have reds. And reds are, is that you strongly disagree, made me feel at ease, made, taught me well, give me teaching, all these type of things. So this is anonymized. So we, we, can't, we don't know who's done it. So if we then go back and we look at someone's portfolio I look at this guy see all this you can see where it comes So now you can see what he has to achieve. Sequel intubation rate greater than 90%. Unassisted physically, 90% of the cases, 9 out of 10. 
did the course, yes he did. Total lifetime procedures, there we go. Procedures in the last three months. Formative lower DOPS. Formative lower GI DOPS. So the DOPIS forms, the ones about taking off the polyps. So they're all complete and up and running. Lifetime. And at the present moment in time, GI DOPS scoring competent independent practice in the last 12 months. So he hasn't got any of those. Sad fact is, is this man is actually currently doing the occasional ad hoc list for a private hospital so he needs to come and see me and he's coming to see me next week because he needs to do this and I'll do it with him. It, they don't have to be you know 100% but that will happen next week and as you can see there is an electronic record when all his information was sent off, payment etc. So that's how that all works. And then there are these things. So you can show his DOPS list. So if we look at this one, say for example, I can pull them up. So when you as a trainee come to me, or somebody come from another hospital, you will already be on this system if you're not independent. I'll just say where you were, I'll put your GMC number in, and I'll pull you up, I'll pull up all the information. I'll also tell you what I do, which is, I'll then say, right, let's have a look. Okay, I know this person, and I know this person. All right, so I'll look at the DOPS, and I know what this person's like. And I'll think, okay, well that says that. And then I'll go to somebody else. I don't know this person. Not complete yet. Not complete yet. Amazing. So the hospital he's been at for the last two years, he's done three. He's done the others with us. He's come back and worked with us. But they've not complete yet. So if he went somewhere where he, I didn't know someone, now this fella's a clown. Now, if I ever saw his, I wouldn't give it. And I, and I know that guy. Okay. So I go along and we actually look at people and we can actually say yes, and this is what we can provide for you. So the UK system, even though it's heavy, it all, it's got a record. As a surgeon, if you, how many surgeons are you? How many surgeons? As surgeons. This is integrated with your surgical portfolio in the UK, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's independent of. And you still have to fill out your surgical logbook and it has to be separate. But as a surgeon, you are disadvantaged in the UK. Because in the UK, you'll find that the gastroenterology trainee will end up having at least one to two lists a week. As a surgeon, you will end up having lucky one to two lists a month because of your commitments elsewhere. So surgeons, at the end of the five, six years, they'll be lucky to see 200 colons. I think I'm gonna call it quits there. Anybody who wants to go over this, I'm more than happy to sit down and chat to you about it. It does do, I think, a good job in monitoring. I think it's become very unwieldy in places. I think it's become very cumbersome. It's very hard to manage, but it's a nice revenue earner. And it's an ex each year you have to pay 70 quid once you've gone through this. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think UK has taken a big leap in uh, in structuring their program, in accountability, in maintain, making sure that your trainees are at least baseline, you know, they has to be similar. And some will become stars who focus and are very passionate. Some will remain, but there's a minimum standard they are ensuring, which is, I think, what is in. I told you, Paul, that we'll share with you um, at Patel Hospital, uh, where some of this is doing the fellowship, in the last 436 colonoscopies that we have done, um, we were not able to 
reached cecum in 14. Of those 14, eight patients had stricturing lesion, could not be passed. Two patients were abandoned because of very poor bowel prep. And four were actually failed colonoscopies. If we remove the 14, our cecal intubation rate is 99.1%. And, and the terminal allele intubation was 95%. Average cecal intubation time was 8.6 minutes of all these 400. These are all comers, not selected, last 450 cases. Um, average terminal allele intubation from cecal pole was 0.8 minutes. And average scope withdrawal time was 6.38 minutes. Average midazolam use was 1.8 milligram. And average nelbifemine, which is skins, was 1.9. We don't have pain score here. But the fact that the sedation is that low tells you uh, that it's, uh, it, it can't be too bad. Okay, in Patel Hospital, we, are, we have um, one other, myself, uh, one other consultant, junior consultant of Zal, our senior fellow who is Zia. Okay, these are the four people. Of these, 90%, maybe 95% were not done by me. Okay, I hardly get a chance to do these procedures anymore. I don't get any of these standard procedures. I was just telling Vakar, I don't get to do ERCPs even here. I don't. Um, the only ERCPs I do are real nonsense ones with pancreatic strictures and pediatrics and large stones and difficult things. So, um, but colonoscopy is standard. I only very rarely get a chance to do it on some VIP who wants to get it done in civil or patel, but generally they won't let me touch it. So it's primarily RF, Zia and, 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 and Afzal, the three of them. And we now do in every colonoscopy, remember I said I will share this with you because we started this our, in our own unit and that's the reason why I'm telling you is not to tell you that we are good or bad. It's basically that we are actually looking and, and the log is maintained for every case and it's done by the nurse uh, endoscopist or technicians. Um, they, they record everything in a register. So all cases are done there. So it's all available for anybody to check, obviously along with the, along with the pictures. Um, so what the reason, I, as I said, I told you this was because that's a national program that has got national input, that has got um, serious teeth, so they can actually stop you from, none of this is available here. And at least in my, first, in, in, in my lifetime, I don't see this happening here in Pakistan. I honestly don't. Uh, but maybe in the future, when you guys take over, maybe things will change. But until such time, we should at least put this in our own wards, in our own units, and, 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 and look at it ourselves. You don't have to share it, but you can actually look at it. And when you get good results, I don't have a problem coming, standing here and sharing. And I'm sure the results are not very different in our unit here either. And we don't have the most fancy equipment in, in, in the hospital, so it's not because we've got absolute state-of-art equipment. Um, uh, you know, we use good systems, but obviously not, not, not the way um, the West uses them. So I just wanted to share this, that if we can achieve it here, I'm sure everybody can. Let me ask you this question. What do you think? Okay. Endoscopy is a skill. You know? Technical thing. You open the car engine three times a year and somebody is doing that every day. Who would you want to send your car to? The same applies to any technical thing you do. You have to have a minimum number. Now, minimum number depends on where you are. Vakar and Paul, if they tomorrow start, start doing 50 colonoscopies a year, I don't think it's going to make a world of a difference to them. Okay? Because they've reached a certain stage after which your numbers go down. Okay? And then it makes no difference because you've learned the trick. It's like driving the car. So you know, you then become a troubleshooter. So they only get to do the colonoscopies that the resident has not been able to do, a fellow has not been able to do. So your skills, you go to a different level. But for someone who's starting, the minimum colonoscopies that you need to do before you are accredited, as we were told, is 200 in UK. Right? That allows you or gives you 
the permission to do it independently if you're passed and you know if you can do it and after that i think if you do any less than that you're not going to be able to maintain or achieve the standards that we were talking about that's my view i don't know paul if is there a number that's minimum minimally required has that been yeah, yeah. after you have been done after you've done the first 200 and you've been given certificate yeah. Okay, so 150 a year. Now, 150 a year means one colonoscopy every other day. Okay, so if you're doing f if you're doing a list of four a week, okay, so you're you'll end up doing about 150 because you'll have time off, etc. So you're looking at doing at least four colonoscopies a week, from what they're saying. But as I said, it it is col endoscopy is very operator dependent as well there are people who become very skilled in driving cars very quickly there are people who take ages they're still looking at the gear while they're using the clutch right and then comes a time where they become as good as everybody else but then there are some who are very good so that difference will remain what we are saying is that at least as i said in let's say uk is going to 95% or there are exceptional centers which are doing better here but you must have at least 90% sequel intubation honest one number one number two because all these cases that i've mentioned to you all these would have pictures taken highly sequel valve appendicular orifice all these cases would be there because all our all our data is archived here as well as any other place where i work so whatever we are saying anybody can go and check and say you know let me see um, and and you'll find the pictures there um uh, one of the points paul made which is very important is you've done a colonoscopy you've reached the cecum why did you reach the cecum because you wanted to have a look at the entire colon right reaching cecum is telling you you've seen you've reached the end of the cecum or uh, end of the colon from your examination point of view and now it's a the second most important thing is did you miss or see whatever you were supposed to and if you fall down in that below a certain level then again reaching cecum becomes in, in, you know is is really not useful so it's a combination of reaching there and i tell my sometimes my juniors that to me it's like playing golf every time you do colonoscopy you are playing against yourself you want to look at your scores of pain you want to look at your time of sequel intubation or terminal ileal intubation you want to come back so every case you're actually you've got a parameter that you want to be at par with okay and if you can do better even better okay so you are you don't need parameters you don't need anybody to tell you what you need to achieve you have to say yeah i want to go there without pain oh god this patient had pain this time i use more sedation so next case is a challenging one i want to reduce it i don't want to use it more what did what wrong did i do yeah for a recently i said recently earlier this week i had a problem with the two bit patients we had eventually i managed to succeed in the case of the one house when i sat down and i said to myself the same things what i also did i sat down with the staff and i said what could i do better Do you think I was in a normal frame of mind? Do you think I was, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And that's what goes through my mind every time. That is something that from the time it occurs, what could I do better? Then I ask those things. Because you're not always going to be there to actually say, so what's wrong with asking the tech guys? See, if you ask me why he's so good, because after 30 years of endoscopy, he still is worried. generally speaking we will say okay why you know if i i'm i'm good yeah i if a patient had pain then it would have have occurred with everybody yeah i'm sure if dr vakar was doing it he would have said so why should i bother if it the reason why they have achieved what they have achieved is because they are constantly trying to improve and as i said before and i'm sure both my colleagues agree if the day you think you know it all 
the day you think you can't get better it's time to call it a day i'm surprised at my juniors when i'm doing difficult cases they move here and there yeah. they go away and i look and i say what well, you know what this is what i just did and they're not there because the thing is difficult sometimes they don't understand and for someone like me i can sit here and watch vakar do upper gi endoscopy and i don't have a problem i don't know why but i still don't mind because i want to see you know how paul is doing something different polypectomy is very standard you know nothing big but it's that's the driving force you want to become good you have to be today for learning and tomorrow trying to maintain where you reached okay any more questions before we call it a day tomorrow morning we'll uh, start with cases and the format will be that two of you will go into the uh, room like you did today and we have the mannequin ready on the in the other room the cases one of the room will be constantly trans, uh, transmitted here i apologize for the horrible voice system that we had today this is the first time in 14 case year workshops that we've had this problem and i can assure you inshallah it will not be there tomorrow i, I get that assurance otherwise some people will be in trouble um so that will be rectified so you can you will have the option you can sit here watch which is very useful don't get bored focus like vakar said think i would do this and wait and see what you are told and then you'll know whether you were thinking right or wrong similarly if you want to use the mannequin we'll have the mannequin ready as well tomorrow what time do we start dr sajda 8:30 8:30 sharp uh, we want to finish off as many cases as we can we had a slight problem with this course because muharram started and we had completely overlooked the dates and so this was booked uh, and then we suddenly realized oops 9 10th is there and 8th also this road is for those who don't live here emejina road is completely gone in muharram so we try not to come to this side monday yeah so monday because the roads close you want to come here you have to be here before 8 o'clock okay and after it's done we will tell you how to get out don't worry about it okay but if you if the road is <laughs> if the roads closed then other than walking across there will be no option so you know it's best you come before 8 o'clock on monday as i said we already done some of the talks today and so we'll hopefully finish Uh, try and finish early on the, on monday um that does not mean we will not give you as many cases as we can that remains there but i think even with all the cases we'll finish early any questions and we have uh, sajda course dinner tomorrow and and there is a place called do darya i don't know why it's called do darya because it's next to the sea <laughs> but then so many things are and there is a, very, a nice restaurant called kebab ji so we are going there for those who are not from karachi and they have issues with reaching please contact somebody tomorrow and liaise and i'm sure dr sajda um, or one of the uh, dr sharia or mainly dr sajda she is the backbone here so she'll she'll tell you how to or what we need to do about it okay please ask questions go home read about some of the things we have given you come back tomorrow and ask questions okay thank you very much